Okay. Uh, so now I'll just make some introductory remarks. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to welcome everyone here to SOAS. Um, SOAS has uh, a long tradition in Tibetan studies. We have the oldest position in Tibetan studies in the United Kingdom, uh, which was David Snellgrove. And in recognition of him, as Charles just mentioned, we now have our third full academic post, uh, the, the David Snellgrove Chair in Tibetan Art History. So we have uh, someone who does uh, Tibetan Buddhism, as Ulrich Pagel, me, who does linguistics, uh, literature, and history, and then Christian Lutzianitz, who, who will be coming to do art history in the fall. As a part of uh, the, our program of Tibetan-related activities, one thing we like to do is this outreach series where we have uh, lectures and other events organized with organizations, let's say, outside of academia. And we're very happy to be uh, hosting this event tonight with uh, Londony. And um, what's the, the purpose of this uh, sort of thing? I think that, you know, most organizations to do with Tibetan studies are either, uh, let's say, interested in the Tibet Tibetan political issue or in Tibetan uh, religion as um, you know, various Dharma centers. So I think what we see here is providing a sort of bridge between the sort of strict academic study of Tibetan and then people who may be interested in, in Tibet for other reasons. And uh, tonight we're going to t be talking about something that, uh, let's say, accrues a certain amount of controversy. And uh, I feel like kind of because of uh, let's say, the kind of feedback we've gotten in the run-up to this, that it's necessary to be very explicit about uh, the intention of uh, tonight's event. Uh, this is not going to be a debate yet. We're not going to decide who wins or, or score different people's uh, presentations. The point is just to have an airing of views in a context which is quite neutral, quite calm, and uh, and then people will you know be able to hear a perspective which maybe is not the perspective they have or a perspective they're used to hearing about. Uh, but for something like this to be meaningful, it's necessary that everyone come and participate in good faith and with an open mind. Uh, and let's say we've been criticized by, if you like, both sides of this controversy for you know, allowing the other party to have a platform. And we've re received criticisms about who we've invited, what order we've put them in, what their talk titles are. Uh, and some of it, you know, extremely uh, impolite uh, criticism. So this had made me somewhat nervous about tonight's event. And as a consequence of that, uh, we decided that it would be unproductive to field questions from the audience. So uh, the structure of tonight's event will be that each of the speakers will have 10 minutes to uh, you know, say whatever he or she likes. Uh, and then once everyone has uh, spoken, then, then I will have 10 minutes where uh, I will see my role as, as effectively making observations that have occurred to me, you know, let's say, if you like, as, a, as an academic. Yeah? So I will try and judge what people said uh, or, or, or think about what people said in terms of the structure of its argument or the broader historical context uh, and make whatever observations seem to me to be appropriate. Uh, and then we will run through everyone again uh, with five minutes for each person to, to correct what they may see as a mispresentation of information in someone else's uh, talk or you know to use that five minutes however they like. Uh, and then that sort of 10 minutes and then five minutes uh, will constitute, if you like, the dialogue aspect. So, you know, if someone feels like his uh, views have been uh, misconstrued or some important facts have been, uh, you know, ignored, that will give everyone opportunity to make some kind of clarifying statement. And then I will end by thanking you all for, uh, for coming. Um, <laughs> so that should be quite straightforward. Okay. So the last uh, thing that I'd like to do in my uh, introductory comments is just uh, to give a kind of very thumbnail sketch of the, you know, the, 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 the question, if you like, 
uh, you know, it's possible that someone here, you know, this is the first they've heard about uh, Dorje Shugden. Uh, possible someone online will just happen to be, you know, uh, wandering onto this site from somewhere else. So maybe good to just uh, give some kind of overall framework. And I preface it by saying that, you know, in, in a contentious uh, situation, it's, it's uh, virtually impossible for uh, everyone here to feel like what I say is a totally accurate representation of history and the current circumstances. So, you know, I'm sorry, yeah? <laughs> uh, in particular, I found that there's a lot of, sort of as often with controversial things, there's a lot of sort of terminological uh, hornet's nests. And so I've tried to, you know, pick terms that haven't been vexatious, yeah? <laughs> um, so I think the, so, so this is the context that I feel like is appropriate, yeah? So for starters, there, there are four major sects and many minor sects of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, the Dalai Lama uh, is the highest reincarnated Lama in the Geluk sect, uh, although he's not the titular head of that sect. That's something that some people are sometimes confused about. Uh, Dorje Shugden, as a practice, uh, came into the Geluk sect from the Sakyas, like most ritual practices. You know, the, the Geluk started, they're the most recent sect that had to get their ritual practices from somewhere, um, in the 18th century. And then in the early 20th century, there was a figure uh, by the name of Pabonka Rinpoche, who was very enthusiastic about the propitiation of Dorje Shugden. And so that practice has become very associated with him and let's say with uh, traits of his outlook and uh, way of doing things, yeah. Um, and so maybe I'll say just a word about that. Uh, Pabonka is a very, shall we say, orthodox gay look. He saw himself very much as a gay look and in the context that he did sort of evangelical work in Eastern Tibet, uh, promoted the Geluk school at the expense of other schools. Uh, so, you know, every school has people who look after orthodoxy. Uh, the 14th Dalai Lama, when he uh, left Tibet, let's see, found it appropriate to try and emphasize a kind of even, uh, sorry, a sort of ecumenical outlook, yeah? So, you know, he may be, uh, historically speaking, so the high incarnate lama of one sect of Tibetan Buddhism, but in the context of uh, that time and that place, you know, it, it was appropriate, at least him and his uh, people around him thought it was appropriate for him to, to be seen as, and he was seen as internationally, the leader of the whole Tibetan exile movement, <laughs> and a figure of importance for all Tibetan Buddhist schools. And in that kind of context, uh, it was seen as significant by him to, to promote a kind of uh, ecumenical spirit. So uh, as a consequence of that, he, he decided and started talking about this already in the 1970s, and then it became a kind of very definitive uh, program, if you like, in the 1990s, that the propitiation of Dorje Shugden should be uh, let's say, less emphasized. Um, so some members of the Gaelic tradition uh, understandably felt like this was an abandonment of orthodoxy and an uh, 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 important component of their uh, tradition and then felt like uh, their allegiance was, you know, kind of uh, divided or, or, or potentially divided between following this, uh, this uh, sort of exhortation by the Dalai Lama versus following you know, their own, uh, their, the, the teachings of their teachers or their Samaya relationships to the practices they do. And so that has led to a schism in the Gaelic sect where, let's say, at least restricting ourselves to speaking about outside of the P PRC, I think it's fair to say that most uh, Gaelics have at least uh, in, in public contexts uh, reconciled themselves to this discouragement of the propitiation of Dorje Shugden. 
Uh, although I say actually Mongolia is an exception to that. It's, it seems just not to have become an issue there, at least to the same extent. Yeah. Um, whereas others, in particular, uh, Geshe Kelsen Gato and those uh, who, who take him as a teacher, uh, have, have decided that this is a, it's important to abide by this component of what they see as orthodoxy. And that's basically where we are now. So one thing I want to emphasize is, you know, the whole issue is kind of basically of no concern to anyone who's not a Geluk in principle. Uh, so why then do, do people get so hot under the collar about this issue? And I would say that that stems from the fact that the, the Dalai Lama has another institutional affiliation besides highest incarnation lineage in the Gaelic sect, and that is, at least before 1950, head of the Tibetan government. So uh, you can see how if someone is head of a government uh, and he says that you shouldn't practice this particular uh, religious activity, you know, that's especially in a modern Western context is something that people see as not a good thing. Uh, whereas, you know, from the perspective of religious hierarchy, well, you know, if you want to participate in the institution that, you know, of his hierarchy, then, you know, it makes sense to do things his way. If you don't, then you can do things whichever way you like. Yeah. So I think that's kind of the, the origin of um, kind of, in, in a sense, the contentiousness and the, f the, the hurt feelings have to do with the kind of traditional dual affiliation of the Dalai Lama and him trying to ne negotiate those uh, affiliations. Yeah, so I think that's what I wanted to say by way of introduction. So now we will have our uh, first speaker, Kelsan Rapden, and he will have 10 minutes. So good evening. Uh, my name is Rapton. I'm here tonight as one of the representatives of the International Food and Community, which is a, a not-for-profit organization registered in the United States. Tonight I want to explain a little bit about the history of this issue and why we're demonstrating and how we hope to resolve the situation. I've only got 10 minutes and quite a lot to say, so I'm afraid I'm going to be quite direct and possibly a little blunt. Sorry about that. Please bear with me. Um, also, I'd like to make quite clear that we're not here to argue. Uh, we very much want to move towards a resolution to this issue. We have tried to establish a dialogue on this with the Dalai Lama and his representatives for nearly 20 years. Um, so even though, we're not there, even though they're not here, uh, maybe this is a step in that direction, who knows? So as you'll be aware, uh, we hold the Dalai Lama responsible for the discrimination experienced by Shugan Buddhists. We believe he is the source of this problem and the only one able to solve it. So by demonstrating, we're asking the Dalai Lama to change. So I presume everyone here knows that during the demonstrations, we ask the Dalai Lama to stop lying and give religious freedom. And I want to explain why we say those things. So when we say stop lying, what are the lies that we are referring to? So specifically, we're referring to things the Dalai Lama said in the speech that instigated the ban on the worship of the enlightened deity, Dorji Shigdom and that caused the social exclusion of Shugden Buddhists. So I'll talk about the ban more in a moment. In that specific speech in spring uh, 1996, he said that people worshipping Shugden harms his life, harms Tibetan people, harms Tibetan independence. So uh, you can read the Kashag statement, May 31st, 1996. It's available on the Dalai Lama's own website. He's approved translation of it. So it says, the essence of his holiness's advice is this, propitiating Dogyal, does great harm to the cause of Tibet, it also imperils the life of the Dalai Lama. Now, in this statement, the cause of Tibet refers to restoring the freedom of their country. So this statement by the Dalai Lama is at the root of the discrimination Shugden Buddhists have endured for the past 20 years. So I question whether any reasonable person could really believe that the reason the Chinese invaded Tibet is because of some people praying to Dorji Shugden 
I would question whether any reasonable person could really believe that the reason the Chinese continue to occupy Tibet is because of some people praying to Doji Shugden. And I don't think any reasonable person really believes the Dalai Lama's life is in danger if people continue to follow their teacher's advice by praying to Doji Shugden. So I would say none of these statements are true, and when we say stop lying, these are the statements we're referring to. The Dalai Lama saying these things is completely irresponsible. They are so obviously inflammatory, it would be impossible to say anything more emotive to a refugee community desperate to return to their homeland. With this speech, from one day to the next, he turned Shugden Buddhists from valued members of the community into pariahs, into traitors, into enemies of the state. The social exclusion that followed from this was entirely predictable, and sadly, the Dalai Lama has done nothing to stop this. Immediately after this speech, the private office of the Dalai Lama communicated his words throughout the Tibetan community, and within weeks, letters were pouring in from charitable organizations supposedly working for the welfare of all Tibetans, saying that they had purged their membership of any Shugden worshippers and in future would not allow any Shugden worshippers in their organizations. So again, I've, got lots, I've brought lots of letters, but there's one on the Dalai Lama's own website with his own approved translation, so I'll quote from that. It's from uh, the Tibetan Youth Congress resolution. I'll read out points eight and nine. So point eight, if anyone in the Youth Congress membership is found as still worshipping Dogyal, that member will be immediately expelled from the Tibetan Youth Congress membership. And nine, this Congress will also urge all other Tibetan organizations not to enroll anyone into their membership who venerates and worships Dogyal. So that is clear discrimination on the basis of religion. It is published on the Dalai Lama's own website. It's still there. You can check it tonight if you like. Has he said even one word to stop this discrimination? So out of blind faith in Dalai Lama, believing what he said to be literally true, non-Shugden practitioners got extremely angry with Shugden Buddhists and tried to force them to give up their faith or tried to force them out of the Tibetan community. Statues and shrines were destroyed. People were threatened and publicly humiliated, refused basic services like treatment in medical clinics and service in shops. So this obviously leads to the other thing that we chant, which is give religious freedom. So I'd like to quote from the United Nations Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and Discrimination Based on Religion or Belief. So this says, No one shall be subject to coercion which would impair his freedom to have a religion or belief of his choice. No one shall be subject to discrimination by any state, institution, group of persons or person on grounds of religion or other beliefs. Discrimination between human beings on grounds of religion or belief constitutes an affront to human dignity and a disavowal of the principles of the Charter of the United Nations and shall be condemned as a violation of the human rights and fundamental freedoms proclaimed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The ostracism of Shugden Buddhists that began with the Dalai Lama's speech in 1996 intensified in 2008 when he instigated a vote to completely segregate the monastic communities. This vote was mirrored in the lay community and Shugden Buddhists were made outcasts from their community. Monks, nuns and lay people took oaths not to have any spiritual or material relationship with Shugden Buddhists. French journalists who documented this called it apartheid in Buddhist land. Some of the Dalai Lama supporters say that Shugden Buddhists do have religious freedom because no one is stopping them practice. However, Shugden Buddhists know that if they practice openly, they'll be immediately branded an enemy of the Dalai Lama, a traitor to the Tibetan cause, that they will face financial ruin because their shops will be boycotted, that they face social exclusion, that their parents, partners or children may sever all ties with them because they believe that in doing so they are fulfilling the Dalai Lama's wishes. So I think that's very clear that that is not the religious freedom the United Nations Declaration is calling for. The Dalai Lama has exerted as much pressure, as much coercion on them as he possibly can, from the initial emotional blackmail of saying, unless you give up your prayers, I will die, through to convincing his supporters that it is Shugden Buddhist's fault that Tibet isn't free, through to standing idly by while Tibetan society is completely segregated in his name. This is behavior that would be unacceptable from any ordinary politician, let alone the most famous Buddhist monk in the world. I mentioned the ban on Doji Shugden worship earlier on. So even today, some people question whether there is a ban. So again, I'd like to quote from the Dalai Lama's own website. You know, this is his own approved translations. 
So from point six of the Assembly of Tibetan People's Deputies, this is the resolution June 96, again, it's online now, you can check it. It says, in forbidding the propitiation of Shugden, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama is following the intention of Guru lineage. So that sentence seems to me to have a subject, a verb, an object. The subject is His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, the verb is forbidding, the object is the propitiation of Shugden. So also from DalaiLama.com, the Tibetan Youth Congress Resolution, point seven, says, together with documents pertaining to this ban on the worship of Shukho, Dogyal, this Congress will urge, and so forth. So if there isn't a ban under Rishi Shugden, what is this resolution referring to? Again, remember, you can read this on his own website. Okay, so another argument some people present is that the existence of Shah Garden and Serpon Monastery shows that there is no ban in the Tibetan community. In fact, since the segregation of the monasteries, although they are geographically within the Tibetan community, spiritually, socially, and materially, they have been completely separated. Some people say they have their own separate monasteries, but separate is not equal, and they are treated as outcasts, not allowed into libraries, health clinics, shops, and temples that are open to the non shugden monks. They are not allowed to make offerings to non shugden monasteries or shrines, take part in the traditional religious ceremonies, and the non shugden people are not allowed to support them. So to resolve this issue, we would request everyone, especially those of you who care about the Dalai Lama's image and reputation, to ask the Dalai Lama to accept the following four points. To allow anyone who wishes to practice Dojo Shugden the freedom to do so, to stop completely the discrimination against Shugden practitioners, to allow all Shugden monks and nuns to be, who have been expelled to return to their monasteries and nunneries, and to receive the same material and spiritual rights as non-Shugden practitioners, to write to Tibetan communities throughout the world telling them that they should apply practically the above three points. So the moment this happens, all our demonstrations will finish. I don't think any of those requests are unreasonable. We simply want these people to have genuine and complete religious freedom. If that happens, all of our protesting is finished. So I was billed, that's my speech, I was billed to talk on a different topic. I hope you weren't disappointed that, that I changed it. If you are interested, we have plenty of these leaflets, uh, Retting Lama, How He Chose the False Dalai Lama, that has the essential points of the talk that I was billed to be given. This felt a little bit more meaningful in the context. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Good evening to everybody, and uh, I'm here to uh, talk on this issue from a personal level. I'm not representing any institutions, any you know, individuals, rather than myself. I think that should be made very clear. Also, the points that I'm going to raise are my own personal views. Mm. Now, my first point is uh, this. Uh, this uh, protector called Shukden uh, has never been Lama Tsongkhapa's teachings and his institution's uh, protector. And that's my first point I'm going to make. And the second point I'm going to make is, since beginning of this protector, sometime 18th century, always caused problem in the community, in the society. And it's up to now, that's why we are here. And if there's time, then I will make a little bit point, a short point, who are, who are the people behind this so-called you know, the international shopping community. And I want to make that point if I had time. Hmm? So Lama Tsongkhapa and his two principal disciples, Kedubje and Gyadubje, wrote 38 volumes of teachings. 38. None of these volumes of teachings mention this uh, shopping issue. Let alone introducing how to practice it. 
This Shugen issue comes after 230 something years after Lama Tsongkhapa's teachings, institutions are well, well established. So there's no ground to claim this uh, uh, Shugen is Tsongkhapa's, uh, you know, uh, traditions, uh, what's called a protector, doesn't need Tsongkhapa's protect, uh, 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 tradition doesn't need extra protection, uh, protector because Tsongkhapa and his followers already introduced three Dharma protectors, Kala Rupa, Vaishamana, Mahakala Six Arm. <coughs> so that is something, my first reason why this protector is not Tsongkhapa's, never been Tsongkhapa's uh, protector. My second point is this. Um, from Tsongkhapa up to present time, there are 102 what we call uh, Gandhin Tiba, the holder of the Tsongkhapa's throne. And uh, you know, the, uh, we have that. None of them, none of them, none of them claimed promote this protector as a Tsongkhapa's, you know, the uh, traditions, institutions, you know, uh, protector. And that should be said very clearly. One, 101 Gandhan Tipa who lives in Paris, some of the, you know, the uh, international Shungen community, they claim he practices. That might be his personal level, but he never ever claim that he is Gelugpa's institution's protector. In fact, before he became Gandhin Tiba, sometime 2002 or three, he went to see His Holiness, saying, from now on I will not practice, and His Holiness and himself, in front of him, more than 200,000 people in Bodhgaya publicly announced this Longrik Namdyal, who is going to be the next Gandhan Tiba, that's the 101. He promised me from now I'm not going to practice. Now if he's practicing now, because he finished his term, that's up to his personal level. I will not argue with that. Another point I want to make is many, many Tibetan great, not non gelupa traditions practitioners, many, many Gelugpa uh, traditions practitioners. Before uh, uh, Pabongga Rinpoche and the Tijang Rinpoche, and during Pabongga Rinpoche and Tijang Rinpoche, strongly reject, strongly argue, worshipping this spirit is something useful or meaningful. If you look at Gandhin Tiba, uh, 50, uh, 54th Gandhin Tiba, now on Chokden, uh, sometime uh, around uh, 18th century, he not just you know reject, but he asked some of the people who are worshipping this protector in Gandhian monastery in Tibet, he asked them to take those possessions outside the Gandhian monastery's boundary. That's the fact. So, there are many, not just the 5th Dalai Lama, not just the 8th Dalai Lama, not just the 13th Dalai Lama, many others, such as Pujong Aung Chamba, such as Yungzing Yishi Jensen, such as Tugin Chujinima, such as Umuchu Dhammapada, they all, such as 8th Panjian Lama, Tempe uh, Wangchu, they all strongly reject. So that is the fact. I want to make the first point that this protector has never been Gelug protector or Tsongkhapa tradition protector. Hmm? Now, the my second point I want to make is since beginning of this, uh, what you call the uh, Shukden, always controversial. Its starting point is controversial because this guy called uh, Takwa Jensen, some, somebody calls he was uh, killed forcefully. Somebody calls he was you know, got uh, some kind of uh, illness. Anyway, he was died when he was 37 or 36 years old. That is the starting point of this spirit. That's the starting point. 
so why it's controversial. And in the middle, when it went to Sadhya, Sadhya master had a great difficulty to accepting him to come. Okay? And there were many controversials. During the Pavanga uh, <coughs> time, as our chair briefly touched on, what did happen in the eastern Tibet, so many unhappiness or cause. Just name of this spirit. And now we are here. Name of this spirit, three uh, monks were killed in Dharamsala. Not long time ago, just a few years ago. In the cold blood, killed three monks. Many people are beaten out of the name of this protector. So it is not healthy protector. Somebody called claim it is some kind of very amazing healthy. It is not very, very controversial and culturally, socially, religiously caused so much divisive. So, and actually, himself, when he went to Sadhya to ask, take me to as your protector, this Sadhya master, you know, uh, the, the, uh, called in his vision, care vision, Sadhya master said, who, who are you? And this spirit said, I am the divisive spirit from Gandhi. That's what he said. And this is well documented in Sadhya uh, Masters, you know, if you want to be. And that's the uh, uh, third, uh, third point I want to make. Now, briefly, my next point is this. This so-called ISC, International Shungden Community, who is behind that? It is clearly, it seems for me, NKT, New Kadamba tradition, is behind all this movement. They started called Western Buddhist, Western Shukden Society, sometime in 1996 uh, or 7, then called Shukden uh, Support Society, or something like that, as, as something I can't remember clearly. Then also, they now they use this term, ISC. All, if you look at people who are there, demonstrating, I would say quite sure, if not 90%, 80% are from NKT. And what uh, the earlier speaker said, they will want to say that, uh, sorry, yeah. I'm going to have to ask you to take a seat. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Hello, thank you for asking me to speak. Um, I'm speaking here as an NKT survivor. I was in the NKT for 12 years, um, practicing Shuten. I was ordained for seven, um, and I left in 2006. So I, um, I will just speak this, uh, my personal views um, as a survivor. So I will speak about what I think Shuten practice is in the New Kadampa tradition, in the NKT. I believe that the NKT is a closed system that needs to silence those who could interfere with its claimed authority. I will argue that the NKT uses Shukden to do this. Shukden practice in the NKT doesn't look like and isn't used in the same way as Shukden protector practice in traditional Tibetan Buddhism. Shukden is used by the NKT as a psychological technique to silence and control the most committed insiders using meditation, and secondly, to silence critical outsiders for example, using Shukten to demonstrate against the so-called human rights abuses of the Dalai Lama. These demonstrations also, importantly, have kept insiders from asking awkward questions about issues back home in the NKT, such as the sexual misconduct of senior teachers in the past. The NKT fiercely protects its own renown or reputation in the West. NKT students have reluctance and even fear of speaking out about possible abuses within the NKT for fear of the consequences, such as criminal arrest, being sued for libel or social exclusion. There are enough documented cases of the NKT making legal threats against speaking to understand this is valid fear. 
But shitten isn't often mentioned in complaints by NKT survivors. They usually complain about issues of control leading to a lack of kindness. But shitten practice is the essential practice of the NKT. Praises, offerings and requests to shitten are made every day in every NKT centre all over the world. To be an NKT centre, you have to do these prayers. And every qualified, pure NKT Dharma teacher is supposed to practice the NKT Shifton meditations before giving any teachings. As Shifton practice is the essence of the NKT and critics of the NKT need to be silenced, then if the Dalai Lama criticizes Shifton, we have to conclude that the Dalai Lama must be silenced too. But the Dalai Lama isn't criticizing the NKT, he's only criticizing Shifton practice. The murmur of the bad reputation of the NKT isn't coming from the Dalai Lama. That's mostly coming from ex-NKT members like myself, who believe what we practiced in the NKT caused us harm, and once we've seen how Dharma is taught elsewhere. And there are no restrictions on Shubdan practice in the UK. So to justify silencing the Dalai Lama, you have to believe he must be harming Tibetans, and you need to find evidence, and try and create a campaign where most people say there is no reason for a campaign as there is very little evidence of human rights abuses. And any campaign will always pale in comparison to the problem of the Chinese invasion. So why this seemingly irrational loyalty to Shibden? I'll discuss how I feel that Shibden uses our own hope, attachment and fear to keep us tied and tongue-tied in the NKT. For a beginner, the NKT offers meditation with gardens and tea. Nothing to interfere with your normal life. The NKT also brands a fast path to enlightenment, a modern Buddhism that is nothing like that boring Tibetan stuff. To have the confidence to get enlightened, you need merit. So you will live in and pay rent at a centre and help to run it and work for the guru by promoting this pure dharma which is on Karpa. Teaching gives you merit for a faster path. If you have merit to be authorised to teach, that's when you get hooked, as I did, by my new hope for quick results into the trio of NKT study, being a teacher and shifted meditations. You accumulate merit even faster if you ordain, but you're told if you disrobe, you won't get enlightened. The NKT needs teachers. It has to produce them very quickly as teachers leave and new centres are opening. Kelsang Gyatso is the reclusive Tibetan monk who created the NKT system. You may only teach using Kelsang Gyatso's books. You study so that you memorise Kelsang Gyatso's books. Heart Jewel is the basic Chibden practice that Kelsang Gyatso created. It's the NKT's Chibden practice. That's where you're told to talk to the guru. If you have any questions your NKT teachers can't ask, you can't ask Kelsang Gyatso in person. And you have, if you have any other problems, you're told to do more heart jewel. Shukta will help you with it all. It's the most confusing meditation practice I have ever done. Looking at the basic scenario <coughs> of heart jewel, the first half is Jason Karpa Guru Yoga. The second part of heart jewels is offerings and requests made to Shukta, an outer practice of Shukta that's very similar to the Gelug Paldan Lama Protector Tea Offering. In this second part, you request knowledge, protection, compassion and power from Guru as Shukta and meditate on downloading the confidence and power to teach or for success in your activities. Shibden is almost everything. Sutra, Tantra, Vajradhara, Buddha Shakyamuni, Manjushri, Jason Karpa, and above all, Kalsang Gyatso appears as Shibden. And you take the Shibden with you when you come out of meditation. I quote three benefits of doing this meditation from Kalsang Gyatso's commentary to Hartjil. By putting your trust in Shibden, your practice will naturally become pure, you will have a powerful ally and you will always make the right decisions. Naturally become pure is what I felt holding the guru, the Shukdan guru in my heart. Having a powerful ally is what I felt when I taught. I could teach the perfect Dharma. You always make the right decisions. After teaching, I often felt as if I was protected from making any mistakes, but only if I stayed on the NKT path. Purity, power, and infallibility. In time, this practice led me to feel, and other teachers around me, that not only was the guru infallible and could make no mistakes, but that I myself was also, without any fault in any decision I made, completely pure and powerful too, and not only during teachings, every day, with everything I did. With my guru's blessings, I can accomplish anything. This feeling is blissful to gorge yourself with and addictive. You aren't ordinary anymore. You're extraordinary and special on this unmistaken path. So you have to protect this absent guru, which is this power you now possess. You have to protect his good renown and his pure lineage. So you go to the demos and join in the defamation campaign, as I did from a distance. Because without Shubden, you think there will be no lineage in the teachings. 
I started to act as if I would do almost anything to protect my access to that feeling of power and control. What else could it be but the power of the lineage? But isn't this twisting of the concept of the purity of the Dharma into our own purity, power, and unmistaken actions as NKT teachers, exactly the shugden of distorted aspiration that causes His Holiness the Dalai Lama's concern, and the real unvoiced harm the NKT system creates? As a perfect NKT teacher, you feel no sense of personal responsibility for the harm your actions could create. While in the NKT, I increasingly saw this system as a hope I was holding up. And feeling that doctrine of purity, infallibility, and power in my teachers led to my conflicts with them. Good teachers I have met since show you what to look for in your own mind, as they know it in their own minds already. It's not about control. Is the NKT trying to blame His Holiness the Dalai Lama for its own problems in maintaining authority? But surely by trying to silence His Holiness, NKT students are also silencing their own inner critics or intuition, their own capacity to see what might have gone wrong. That's why we as survivors feel so confused when we leave the NKT. As long as Shugden practice feels so good, and Khao San Gyatso is conceptually confused with Shugden, then NKT followers will remain deeply attached to the Shukdan guru, fearful of stopping the practice without breaking Samaya and going to hell, and fiercely protective of what appears to them to be perfect as it makes them feel perfect. You can't see this while you're in it, but I see the Shukdan NKT and Khao San Gyatso system as only seeking to maintain itself, not a lineage. I think I can seriously state that in the NKT you become not a practitioner, but a Shugden follower. You may start out wanting to be a better person, wanting to make the world a better place, but you have very little idea of what you are missing out on and the price you will pay for your loyalty if you walk in that door wanting Dharma. That is the sadness. Thank you very much. I'll just say next slide, yeah, if you could. Slide, but... Is that okay? Yeah, how do I make it go widescreen? Oh, go up to slideshow. Yeah. There we are, a little show and tell here. If you don't know how PowerPoint works, uh, go from the beginning. There we are, and just click as we go along. Okay. Um, and, and this is Martin Mills. My name is Martin Mills. Um, I'm an anthropologist, and I've recently been instructed on various websites that because I do not have a degree in international law, I cannot speak on the subject of human rights, so I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm going to tell a story, and let's keep it a little simple there, because uh, do I know what side I'm on here? No, I probably don't. Um, I first came across Dorji Shugden when I was doing my doctoral work in Ladakh in 1993. If you don't know where Ladakh is, here's a map of India. Um, the little square up here is uh, the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And Ladakh is an area of India that abuts onto the Tibetan Plateau. And since 1842, when it came under the Maharaja of Kashmir, uh, has been, effectively speaking, part of what is now modern India. So it's a bit of Tibet that is part of India. It's important to note in that sense that for a couple of hundred years, it was not under the jurisdiction of Lhasa. Okay, it's not traditionally under the jurisdiction of the Dalai Lamas, um, and it's an area which nonetheless is very important, particularly to the diaspora of Tibetan Buddhists, because it is a crucial area in which Tibetan Buddhism has flourished and maintained itself for a thousand years, largely uninterrupted by Chinese invasion or anything of that nature. Um, yes, next slide. Um, the work that I did... Initially, rather naively, I went and did my PhD. I wanted to write a book about a Tibetan monastery and how they work. I'm an anthropologist. What we do when we do that is we go to a place, we dig in, we ask lots of favours, and we stay put for, in my case, one and a half years. And I lived um, in this monastery here. Um, 
I shan't name it because we won't go there. Um, but, you know, uh, if you read my book about it, you'll know where it is. If you read my most recent article that you can find on the web, then, you know, you'll know all of this. But I don't want to get bogged in now, in down in those particular details. Um, this is a Gulukpa monastery. It belongs to Nairi Rinpoche. It is part of a series of monasteries that belong to Nairi Rinpoche, who is the Dalai Lama's younger brother, that are in Ladakh. Um, as you can see, it's in a rural area. At this point in time, it was seven days' walk from the nearest road. Rather unhappily, it's now four days' walk, four hours' walk from the nearest road, which is a shame. Um, and uh, it's a Gulukpa monastery. It was founded by Changsem Sherab Zangpo a little after Tsongkhapa. Um, and they extraordinarily kindly put me up for six months uh, while I stayed and studied their rituals and, and, and did all of those things. Um, a crucial part of this, next slide, well, I'll say a crucial part, a part of this was the fact that it was a Gelup monastery in 1994 that had Dorje Shugden as a worldly protector. Now, I, I'm going to say that bit here because that's an important, crucial distinction. For the, from the NKT's perspective, Dorje Shugden is a wisdom Buddha. Okay? From, most, from Ladakhi's perspective, he's what's called a Jigtinpela, a worldly deity. He's, he hasn't achieved enlightenment. But those two things often go together, um, and they are kind of put together under that word, Dorje Shugden. And I, I don't want to get bogged down in the theology of that, because that would go on forever. Um, he's a very high ra- he was a very high-ranking protector, and regularly possessed um, a, a, a Ladakhi oracle. Um, I shan't give his name. Let's not go there. Um, who um, was an army man who became regularly possessed from about the age of the late 20s, in his late 20s. Um, and there was a very long process of, of, of choosing him and finding out who he was being possessed by. And, um, and what he did in this case was, it was he was seen as being possessed episodically. Um, by either Dorje Shukden or by his minister, uh, Kachi Marpo. And um, he would, as you can see, kind of wear the uh, appropriate robes and everything on those lines. Um, because Dr. Galtzen was famously and uh, theoretically either died at his own hands or was murdered by having prayer scarves stuffed down his throat, um, the oracle goes into possession by garroting himself with prayer scarves. Um, It is, I must admit, particularly this possession here, which is the first one I ever witnessed of many, uh, and I interviewed the oracle and everything, um, it's a terrifying thing to see. When someone goes into full possession, this gentleman, it looks like every bone in his body dislocates at once. Um, It is deeply persuasive in a physical way that something is (coughs) happening that, as an anthropologist, we don't understand yet, and we should probably get on with that. Um... Shukden was one of 11 protectors of this monastery. He was one of two worldly protectors. The other one was a local god called Shah Chokspa. Um, and I, I think it's important to note that. We stand at the moment, and particularly in Britain, in a situation that says the world is divided into people that follow the Dalai Lama and people that are Shukdinpas. This lot here would never call themselves Shugdenpas. They would say, we have a worldly protector for our monastery, and we have two. And both of them are possessed by oracles. And often those two oracles will go into possession together. In that sense, and they would sit there and say, if you said, who's the protector? They would say, a real one. Oh, you know, maybe Vajabharada, you know, maybe Mahakala, you know, maybe one of the other 11. But if you said, are you a Shugden worshiper, they would go, that doesn't make sense to them. Um, in particular, if you ask them, they would say, this is a worldly deity, and therefore it is a Rokspa. It is a helper. Um, the, one of the things they say in Ladakh is, La Lama Yoga. The Lama is higher than the gods. It's a very common saying. The Lama is higher than the gods. And in that sense, they wouldn't kind of define themselves in those terms. They also regularly, I hasten to add, put the Dalai Lama and Shugden together. They understood that the Dalai Lama had strong views on the matter, but they had a monastic protector. They followed the Dalai Lama. Monlam Chenmo in 1993, for example, they brought out a big photograph of the Dalai Lama. Everyone in the village 
um, everyone in the village prostrated before it and prostrated before the tormas, which included the tormas, the sort of votive offerings, which included a torma to Shugden. And the Shugden oracle was there. These things went together. So our present state of deep polarization that occurs particularly from the British perspective is not one that is shared by Ladakis. They didn't think about it that way. Now, um, next slide. Ladakh was an area of proselytization that was, began to become influenced by the politics that surrounded Shukdan in Dharamsala and, and many of the refugee communities. Um, this is Dagon Rinpoche. Um, those of you who know this area will know that name. This is him arriving to... Actually, he, he did arrive to give various teachings on a variety of things, such as the 13 Vajra Bharadas and a variety of things, including Shukdan. Um, this is him arriving in the village here. Um, just to give you a sense of, for if you're not used to this, this is him, this is his handout, this is everyone in the village receiving a blessing. Um, ladies first, in this case. Um, and that, and he was there to, in some sense or other, strengthen Shugden practice, or the use of Shugden as a protector in Ladakh in the 1990s, and that was certainly uh, occurring. Um, now, we get to 1995 and 6. Can I have the next slide? Oh, not that one. No. <laughs> one other. Go back. Thank you. I will stay there then. We'll stay here. That's a, that's or a... I can skip to it if you want. No, no, that's <laughs> okay. all right. Let's stay where we are. I'll come back to that last slide in which I'll give an opinion. <laughs> um, the, the, what was the effect of the Dalai Lama's teachings in 1996 on this community? Okay. Now, this is important for when we discuss those things about is it a ban, is it not a ban, all of those kinds of things. Uh, the first thing was, when the Dalai Lama made his announcement, um, I was busy writing up my PhD, which you've read. Oh, really? Okay, I'll have to be quick then. Um, <laughs> and about a few months later, the, the abbot and several of the other monks made the journey to Lay to phone me up in my office in, in Edinburgh where I was doing my PhD and said, can you not say anything about Shugden? We'll get rid of him. But if you say we've got him, we'll have him forever in that book. Um, and so I had to remove 12,000 words of my thesis, um, which is what we do in my job because we protect our informants. Um, they have subsequently got rid of it, and they allow me to actually say these things, so that's all right. But when I went to 1997, and I asked around about this, and I asked a lot of people about this, the first thing they said, and I think this is a crucial kind of point, the first thing they said was, we wish the Shugden supporters community would be quiet. I'm sorry to say that. I'm going to be blunt. You were blunt earlier, so that's fine in your excellent speech. I'm really sorry. I have to okay. ask you to sit down. Oh, all right. It'll be a couple of minutes later on. Until I get five minutes later on. Um, I can, I, can I, for 30 seconds, go to the next slide? I can't. No. Oh. Down, Darn. All right. Next speak is Thierry Dodan. Thierry, I'll give you a one minute. I'll give you a notice at one minute, okay? The what? I notice. Oh, I have half technology here. Excellent. Because I need that. I'll start at the same time then. I don't know to write what time is exactly. I'm just doing it. First of all, I have to apologize for having so late. I got stuck stupidly and then I got to the wrong campus. <laughs> all right, so we can start, yeah? So um, I will leave aside the issue of uh, the origin of Shugden worship because this is a field which uh, I'm not a specialist in. Um, and um, I also do no excursion in the thorny and slippery and foggy fields of theology like you avoided to do because they're stretchable and dangerous. And again, I'm not a specialist. But I concentrate instead on patterns, uh, sociological and political and religion sociological patterns, which is what I'm dealing with, mainly. Um, instead of discussing facts, I'm trying to figure out what 
in the different chapters of the history of Shugden worship since the fifth Dalai Lama, what was particularly obvious or particularly uh, um, a, has been regarded as a problem? Well, you have to see that I think you come to two concepts. That is a concept of elitism and of, of divisiveness as opposed to inclusiveness. Um, the uh, disputes inside to have started with the fifth Dalai Lama are uh, adopting mainly, there's several issues, but one of the main issues that the fifth Dalai Lama adopted for, for the state of Tibet are uh, rituals and deities, I don't go into details, which actually belong to other schools of Tibetan Buddhism, in particular Nyingmaka school. And there were people among the Gelugpa who had become the strongest school, at least in central Tibet, who were bluntly refusing that in their own writing because they saw their tradition as being the pure tradition. And hence, uh, it would not be right to adopt deities and practice from other schools. What happened after the death of the fifth Dalai Lama and uh, his regent, Sangi Gyatso, is actually, yeah, many people will pretend it is very clear. Actually, it's not clear at all. How should then practice become uh, widespread uh, feature of Kalupa school, because it has become that, it had become that, is not entirely clear. Partly because, uh, to a large extent, because it left not so many traces in scriptures. A lot of that is uh, oral transmission, and a lot of things which existed at that time, we don't know anymore because there's no, not much evidence. We have a lot of things on indirect evidence. Right. But what we know for sure is that at the beginning of the 20th century, we have the following situation. We have a situation in which Shukden worship has become rather the rule than the exception among the Gelugpa school. Prayers are rec recited regularly, which make a clear distinction between the Gelugpa tradition and other traditions. Uh, we have most of regions, regions of Tibet uh, who are clearly uh, Shukden followers. This is very important politically because in that time there were not many Dalai Lamas. I mean, they were there, but most of them died very young for various reasons. And hence, the Dalai Lamas were not mostly, mostly not governing, but regents. Um, there always has been a stronghold of uh, Shukden worship in Eastern Tibet among Kangpas. And the sociological reasons for that are very clear. At the country of central Tibet, uh, where Gelugpa school is clearly dominant and there is no way around it, in eastern Tibet the situation is more complex. Uh, the uh, Gelugpa monasteries are very big and very strong, but there are more pockets surrounded by non-Gelugpas. And hence, you can see why the need is stronger, or is felt stronger, I'm not saying it's stronger as such, uh, to have something which makes the difference between Geluk and other schools. An important uh, uh, episode in Tibetan history uh, regarding the Shuk Den is the uh, relationship between the two monasteries of Sera and Drepung. Um, I will leave it alone with, uh, aside this uh, situation in Ganden because that is very complex and actually not, not very well researched as far as I can see. If somebody knows better, please contradict me. Um, First, Sarah has a stronger link to Eastern Tibet, Kampas. And um, second, Sarah has a stronger link to Beijing, to the Qing court, Qing Manju court. And also to Tashilompo, where also the Shukden uh, practice is very strong. So we have here a kind of axis, which is, it is moving. Nothing is black and white. Reality is always gray, but you have <coughs> the usual suspects it, I don't mean in pejorative sense, but all, you know, always this, this kind of patterns recurring. There are exceptions, but you have this link between uh, Beijing and Lhasa. You have Sera, you have Tashilompo, you have Eastern Tibet, the Kampas, the uh, Geluk Kampas, and you have Shukden. And always the uh, circle of the uh, Shukden worshipper. separate themselves, make the difference between themselves. This seems to be the essence between themselves and the non-Gelugpas. 
which from the point of view might be right. I'm not going to do that as such. But I think it is important if you want to understand the situation from a social and political point of view. Um, then at the, we have the, the, the chapter of Pavon Karimboche. Pavon Karimboche has been universally recognized as, a, as a great, one of the greatest Tibetan scholars. There is no doubt about that. If you can also outside the Yelupa school as such. But also very strong, very, very strong uh, in recent uh, century, uh, definitely as strong as the tract of Shukhan um, and uh, the tract of Geluk supremacy. Um, it is a little bit, there is a discussion as to how important this role really was. There are people now who say, who, are, who tend to be anti Shukhan, and who say actually he has really introduced it. I personally don't, don't agree with that, but as I said, more research needs to be done on that. Important for our, for our pattern, which we are looking at, is that uh, we have to do again with a highly revered person, but uh, somebody who has made a strong opposition between Gelugpa and non Gelugpa, and is a detractor of Shukte. Then we have other, uh, uh, in the 20th century, uh, the, tash, the tensions with Tashi Lumpo, the Serra crisis in 1947. Again, Shukde plays a role in that. Comes exile in the early years of exile, the Damsala establishment is clearly in the hands of uh, Gelukpa, Central Tibetans, and Shukden followers. There are also Eastern Tibetans campus, and do not deny that. Not a large number, but they are there. Uh, some are very important, but uh, uh, they all are Shukden followers. People who are not devoted should then are not belong, don't belong to the leadership. And this has changed, of course, during the 70s and during the 80s, partly to a large extent because of the Dalai Lama himself, and there are other factors that played a role, new generation, uh, uh, Tibetan Youth Congress was at that time a very important and very big organization. And politi politics became more participative during mainly the 80s, and I've left one minute and 50 seconds, uh, yeah, 50 seconds, which is not much. Um, the last chapter of divisiveness, to make it a small jump, was uh, some years ago, six, seven years ago, when there was a big decision struggle in the monasteries in South India, uh, where the Dalai Lama and people following him, to my observation, a very, very large majority, opposed uh, that uh, should their worship still be practiced in the monasteries, in these big monasteries, and asked, and they were asked to leave and go and create their own monasteries, which finally, after a lot of, lot of struggles, uh, happened. So again, we have to do with a clear separation between should then yeah, and on should then. I will leave aside one point, which I wanted to make about a three current uh, uh, group. Um, one which appears to me important is that there are three main, roughly, three main Shukden group nowadays. You speak about Shukden, Shukden part. Actually, it's not such a unified uh, word. There is one faction which is around mainly today, uh, uh, the monk in, in uh, India who calls himself Kundalini Rinpoche. There is NKT and Kersan Gyatso. And there is Gangchen Nama. Uh, I've mainly encountered Gangchen Nama. Gangchen Nama is close to the Beijing Panchen. Gangchen Nama is supporting uh, the construction of Shukden statues in different monasteries in Tibet. He was behind the intronization of Gonsar Rinpoche, which has been published uh, very much in the last couple of weeks. Hi, Terry. I'm going to have to ask you to. I'm finished. Yeah. Brilliant. I'm finished, actually. <laughs> Thank you.
Millions of people throughout the world, uh, Tibetans and non-Tibetans, believe that Dorje Shugden is an enlightened deity, an emanation of the wisdom Buddha, Manjushri. We have valid reasons for this belief, this beneficial belief. The practice of Dorje Shugden increases the power of meditation on compassion and wisdom and helps to protect the development of compassion and wisdom in the world. Two qualities so badly needed in our modern times. The Dalai Lama says that Dorje Shugden is a spirit, but he can give no evidence for this. He claims that Shugden practice shortens his lifespan and harms Tibetan independence, but he gives no evidence for these claims. Following his own political aims, in 1996, the Dalai Lama banned the Buddhist practice of Dorji Shugden. Using his influence and power within Tibetan society, he banned this mainstream Buddhist practice. Since then, to the present day, the Tibetan population worldwide has been divided by this ban. And the Buddhist world is also divided because of this ban. This ban has caused continuous persecution and immense suffering. Before the ban, Tibetans lived together harmoniously, both Shugden practitioners and non-Shugden practitioners, like brothers and sisters, happily sharing monasteries, shops, hospitals and schools. Now they have been forced to separate, and the peace, trust and harmony have been destroyed. Since the ban and its enforcement by the Dalai Lama's supporters, Shugden practitioners have been forced to choose. Either sign an oath to give up the practice of Dorji Shugden, or suffer loss of human rights, persecution and violence. Monks refusing to sign the oath were expelled from their monasteries. In one month alone, February 2008, 900 Shugden monks were expelled from their monastery. People who refuse to sign the oath are ostracized or expelled from their communities. They are denied basic human rights. Shugden practitioners are banned from entering shops, restaurants and hospitals. Whole communities are segregated. Families have been divided. Tibetan government employers were sent letters saying that if they did not give up their practice at Dorji Shugden, they would have to resign their jobs. The harm caused by this ban extends far and wide beyond the Tibetan community. Three years ago, a lawyer requested me to help a poor Shugden practitioner from Mongolia, who was seeking asylum in the UK. While he had been a monk in Mongolia, he had suffered false imprisonment and terrible abuse and torture for his refusal to abandon his practice of Dorji Shugden. After escaping from Mongolia, while living in London, he had been badly beaten up in Paddington by fanatical Mog Mongolian supporters of the Dalai Lama. At our first meeting, he kept asking me to prove that I was a Dorji Shugden practitioner because he was terrified of being persecuted by supporters of the Dalai Lama. He had lost everything. He understood clearly that the source of all his unnecessary suffering was the Dalai Lama, whose <coughs> power and influence even pervades Mongolia. Shugden practitioners suffer discrimination and segregation. They live in fear for themselves and their families. Some have been threatened, physically harmed, and even killed. Why? Simply because they would not give up their religious freedom to practice Dorji Shugden. 
I'd like to play a, a short video just to illustrate some of these points. <coughs> that on. Get this to work. And to show really that the Dalai Lama's role in this suffering. <laughs> Nothing distinguishes this Buddhist monk from another one. Delatang is a Shipman monk since the past two months. In this village of Tibetan refugees in South India, all doors have been closed to him and to all the members of his community. Look what's written here. Shipman worshippers cannot enter. They are banned from entering not only shops, but also public institutions. It's apartheid on Buddhist land. Yeah, you see this one. This is oil. So in the limited oil, don't come in this hospital. They are also forced to take an oath saying that they do not follow Shudden and have no contact with any Shudden devotee. They know that Shudden were expelled from monasteries. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too ashamed to bring us such trouble. Get them to go. Get rid of them. A few weeks after the Dalai Lama's speech, Shukden monks could no longer enter monasteries. They were to remove themselves away from the monastery. Henceforth, they would be regarded as rebels, traitors who turned their backs on their master. Geisha looks on Gondon, 72 years old. On the one hand, we cannot speak with the Dalai Lama. On the other hand, we have no choice but to act against his words. I keep thinking, if only I were already dead. Recently, I've come to know that religious, uh, religion is no more uh, worth freedom. We've hmm. been given two choices of either worshipping His Holiness the Dalai Lama or the deity Torji Shudden. Mm. If we choose deity Dorji Shudden, we mm. are treated, treated as outcasts. Mm. Uh, in India, outcast is treat, uh, treated as the worst uh, punishment for a person that you can ever give up. There are so many people that are still in the administration's problems at Past, they put a list, hit, uh, the list of the hit people and they destroyed them, and last time they even uh, they murdered them. Posting denunciations on public walls. They denounce the worshippers of this deity, giving name, address, and often detailed information about its followers and their whereabouts. Why don't you simply advise people not to worship the deity Doshi Shukden? and instruct others to be tolerant and avoid violence against yeah. those who continue to worship it. Uh, one who is against the Dalai Lama must be opposed without hesitation with men, money, and possessions. That is to say, by all means, including violence. But I've seen the calls for violence no. in the newspaper. No. I've seen it with my own eyes. No. I did rumors. <laughs> And what they're trying to do is intimidate people who are, uh, are stand up to them. This is my wife's name. The names of all my children are listed, including concrete information on what school they attend. These wanted posters have been posted everywhere. I assume this is meant as encouragement to kill us. <laughs> One can't simply wipe away devotion to this deity. Our fathers and our mothers died. The Chinese killed them. Though this was terrible, it didn't strike our innermost being. This ban, however, stabs us right in our hearts. The Dukden family was literally chased out of their residential area. About a hundred people attacked us. Had we gone out of our house, they definitely would have killed us. 
Fanatical followers of the Dalai Lama tried to burn down this family's house. They broke into our house and destroyed everything. Only a few victims are willing to speak out against this persecution. They said that you, uh, you, no one is supposed to talk to us and uh, no one is supposed to have any contact with us. So uh, now I will make a few little comments on each presentation as they occurred to me and I took some notes. Okay, so on uh, Kelson Robtens, uh, he s regards the idea that the worship of Dr. Shugden is harmful to the Dalai Lama's life as implausible. And I think it's just important to note that in a, in a traditional Tibetan Buddhist context, I, there's nothing implausible about that. You know, the fifth Dalai Lama. Uh, would use tantric rituals uh, as a military, you know, technique against his enemies. You know, uh, in addition to things like armies and and the the traditional, you know, military technologies, he also used tantric rituals. So, if, you know, if a tantric ritual is capable of uh, killing Mongols, it's probably also capable of harming the the life of the Dalai Lama. So, I I find nothing, you know, I mean, I may find something implausible about that, but I if I do, it's as a a kind of Western empirical uh, viewpoint, but from a traditional viewpoint, there's nothing implausible about that. Yeah. Um, yeah and then I, I think that although you know the Dalai Lama may have said that um, uh, the propitiation of Shudan is sort of bad for the cause, uh, I sometimes felt like he was characterizing that position as it's Georgia Shudan's fault. That uh, that China uh, annexed Tibet, and I think that you know that's a bit uh, kind of uh, a bit of overplaying. It. Certainly, the Dalai Lama must think that there was uh, something to do with you know the People's Liberation Army and Mao Zedong, and these may have also factored into uh, the annexation of uh, Tibet by China. So, turning to uh, Geshe Tashi Tsering's talk. Uh, the point that in the writings of Tsongkhapa and Kedip J and so on, Dorje Shugen is not mentioned uh, is, of course, the case because Dorje Shugen sort of hadn't been invented yet. Yeah, I mean, some people may take issue with this term, you know, invented, but in any case, uh, the, the propitiation of Dorje Shugen hadn't be, been introduced into the, into the kind of ritual repertoire of the Gaelic school. That doesn't necessarily have any bearing on the quote, orthodoxy or status of the of the practice in later times. And by way of analogy, I would say, if you look at the writings of, uh, of uh, uh, sort of some, uh, who am I thinking, Thomas Aquinas. If you look at the writings of Thomas Aquinas, there'll be no mention of Our Lady of Fatima. Well, that doesn't mean that Our Lady of Fatima is some kind of worldly spirit who's doing evil. It just means that you know history moves forward. Yeah. Um, I thought it was very interesting to hear this list of uh, people in the past who had <coughs> thought the propitiation of Dorje Shugden was, was uh, problematic. Um, but I think also that can be overemphasized. You know, we saw from Martin's presentation and then also in uh, Thierry's that, you know, let's say before the 1970s within the Gaelic school, uh, it's certainly the case that uh, the practice of Dorje Shugden was seen as uh, far less problematic than it is now seen. <laughs> so uh, I think that's something to keep in mind. And then I also wanted to mention that several of the presentations um, hit uh, or touched upon the origin of the the figure of George Shugden and the death of Trakpa Galson. Uh, I just want to point out that in in terms of Tibetan studies, that story is seen as as somewhat, um, let's say, may, maybe not. Uh, it, it may be that that's a a story that only you know we can only have evidence of l long after the events that are uh, being described, and there are there are other explanations for how uh, the propitiation of Dorje Shugden 
uh, was introduced into the uh, Gaelic school. So turning to Carol's talk, uh, you know, to the extent that Carol's talk was about her personal experience, there's far less to, to say about it. Um, I found uh, sort of two, th or one theme interesting with sort of two points, which is the question of kind of continuity versus change. So on the one hand, it, it sounds like the kind of ritual program within an NKT center is actually quite different from, a, a, let's say, a traditional uh, Gaelic ritual program as it might have been seen, let's say, in Lhasa in the 1940s. Uh, so, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, as I said, you know, things change. Um, but it seems a bit to contrast with this sort of kind of claim to orthodoxy and, you know, just the name, Nukadampa, is definitely sort of playing towards orthodoxy. And yet, uh, you know, in, in certain ways, uh, uh, Geshe uh, Kelsengato, you know, is willing to innovate in terms of the ritual program. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, and then, uh, but the, the other thing I, I, want, I noticed is some of the things she picked up as problematic, like, you know, sort of putting the, the, your teacher in your heart, the, the vow of Samaya, where you see your teacher is doing no wrong, uh, the question of accumulation of merit and teaching in particular, accumulating merit. These are all, you know, completely standard things in, in, uh, in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, which is not to say that they, you know, they may not have been misused. Of course, tantric practice is seen as very powerful for leading to enlightenment, but of course also, you know, traditional teachers will tell you it's very dangerous. But I just wanted to emphasize to people who may not have context that, that many of these things she was mentioning are quite common, uh, in, including something like the fear of hell, and then also uh, sexual, harass, uh, sexual misconduct or sexual harassment is very well known in other Tibetan Buddhist schools. Uh, so, you know, it's important maybe just not to overstate how unique uh, that situation might be. Um, turning to uh, Martin's uh, presentation, uh, I hope we'll get to see the end of it in his uh, <laughs> in his uh, five minutes. I found it maybe the most informative, in a sense, in terms of showing us what was uh, the propitiation of Dorje Shudin uh, like, uh, sort of before the flaring up of this controversy in a traditional setting. Uh, and it is clear that. Uh, let's say, for for at least in that monastery in Ladakh, in the in the early 1990s, uh, this was just a normal part of the ritual program, uh, and was unproblematic. Uh, so then, uh, on Terry's uh, talk, uh, I thought it was important. He emphasized uh, the fifth Dalai Lama and the fifth Dalai Lama's use of uh, Nyingma ritual practices, and I I was trying to keep my comments at the beginning short. I do think this is an important observation. And that the 14th Dalai Lama is quite interested in um, kind of recalling the memory of the fifth and the sort of ritual decisions of the fifth, and if you like, the ecumenicism of the fifth. You know, the fifth is a very famous, very powerful guy, so if you kind of act like the fifth, that's going to give you a certain amount of uh, credentials. Uh, and to, to some extent, what's interesting to me is that although the the institution of the Dalai Lama and the hierarchy of the Gelug Church are, you know, extremely intertwined and have been for a long time. Uh, to some extent, one can recognize the Dalai, La the Dalai Lama as an independent, uh, independent institution and uh, has its own kind of ritual interests and legitimacy uh, interests that to some extent can be isolated from those of the, of the Gelug hierarchy. Uh, and I agree with him certainly by saying that no controversy is black and white. Turning to the last presentation, uh, the question of whether Dorje Shudin is a spirit or an enlightened being gets a lot of air. Uh, I think it's important to use the Tibetan terms in these contexts because using English can exaggerate the seeming differences. Uh, and I think that, that Martin's talk uh, pointed to this. And then I also think it's important to recognize that whether a particular entity is a worldly spirit or a fully enlightened Buddha is not a question that is uh, amenable to empirical verification. Um, <laughs> I, I, 
also uh, thought that certain statements he made were a bit exaggerated, such as, yeah, such as uh, Buddhism, <laughs> the Buddhist world is divided. You know, certainly in Thailand and Sri Lanka, and uh, no one cares about this question. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, and in fact, you know, uh, uh, also the, the kind of innovativeness of this uh, schism. You know, there's a schism in the Karmakagyu sect as well. You know, uh, there was a civil war between, uh, you know, the Prince of Tsang and <laughs> the Fifth Dalai Lama. You know, violence and schism and divisiveness is is a is a is a hoary tradition in in Tibetan Buddhism and and uh, <laughs> and that should be you know also kept uh, in mind. Uh, and I think to some extent both sides of this debate kind of overplay its significance because they're coming at the world from a Gaelic perspective. And, and as a non-Gaelic, you know, I want to make that uh, point. Uh, nonetheless... <laughs> oh. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the other speakers, and particularly thank Nathan for his summary. That was very uh, informative. Uh, what to respond to? So, I guess, I think, actually, one of the points that, that uh, Nathan made was that there is no way to determine whether a certain entity is an enlightened one or a non-enlightened one. At the end of the day, that's a question of belief. Uh, Geshe Tashi cited various sources. Uh, we would contest those sources. Some of them, he said, was a fact. We would say categorically they're not facts. Um, for example, I think he, he did the Gandan Tripa Nawang Chugdun saying that he was against Dodi Chugdun. In his biography, that isn't mentioned. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is we could argue that forever. Uh, what, what, one of the things that became very clear is that there is within the Galugpa tradition a very clear lineage of relying upon Doji Shugdam that was held by uh, Kyabdu Tudem Rinpoche, one of the most highly regarded Galugpa Lamas by his Lama, the Bonka Rinpoche. And it would seem completely reasonable for that Galugpa lineage to be able to continue within the Galugpa monasteries. We would feel that for anyone to say those people are unacceptable within our monasteries, who, who has the authority to do that? The Dalai Lama certainly doesn't have the authority to do that. He's not the head of the Galupa lineage. Um, some people would say, well, the Gandan Tripa has that authority, but the Gandan Tripa is just appointed by the Dalai Lama, so he doesn't really have any power. One, one of the points Geshe Tashi mentioned was about the 101st Gandan Tripa, suggesting that he had lied which I see that situation in a very different way. Like, in order for him to help his, his students, in order to, to promote his teachings, he had to pretend, he had to hide. That's a horrible state of affairs where someone has to hide their faith when it's the faith, the practices that their own teacher has given them. Something that through their own experience they know is bringing them tremendous benefit. Um, so, uh, maybe, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's useful to go through these, through these things, but possibly... Uh, Geshe Tashi said there's no uh, scriptural reference within Jason Karpa's teachings for reliance upon Dorji Shugden. Uh, Nathan made the point, well, of course not, because Dorji Shugden didn't appear until many hundreds of years later. We would say, as Dorji Shugden practitioners, that by his example, Jason Karpa was relying upon Dorji Shugden because he had Dotsen Drakpa Gyaltsen as his main assistant in establishing his monasteries and helping him produces texts and so forth. So do, for us, Dutsin Drapa Gyaltsen is Doji Shugden. So there's a, there's a very clear uh, example of him relying upon Doji Shugden in his lifetime. Uh, the, again, um, the notion that because Doji Shugden isn't mentioned in Jason Karpa's texts, therefore he's not a suitable protector for Galupas, Paladin Lama. Jason Karpa never relied upon Paladin Lama. That's an invention that came later. Um, but the Dalai Lama relies upon Paladin Lama, is that not okay? Uh, what else do we have? So then uh, the, quotes, the quotes he listed, these various scriptural authorities, they're disputed. You can look on the internet, you'll find scholars from the Dura Shugan side disputing those quotes. It doesn't prove anything. We have our sources, you have your sources. Why not just let us believe and practice what we want? 
and allow within the Galupa monasteries that very clear tradition of Galupa to continue. Why throw it out? How, how is that acceptable? Uh, again, you know, the, 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 the question of Pabonka Rinpoche's activities, that is highly disputed. Uh, previously, uh, that was not an accepted history. It was a certain group of people said he did those things. The majority of people didn't believe that. Uh, nowadays, obviously, history is written by the victors. The Dalai Lama is now seemingly against Pabon Rinpoche, and what is history is changing. Um, you can read uh, Geshe Lundrup uh, autobiography. He was alive at the time of Pabon He was alive during the, the time these supposed events were happening. He says the opposite was happening. He said Pabon Rinpoche was just a very inspiring teacher. These slanders of him are completely unjust. He was, he's a living testimony of having been there at that time. The... Uh, the, the Yeshe Tashi, again, he mentioned violence, he mentioned murders. No one's been convicted of those murders. And yet, repeatedly, again and again and again, this slander is brought up forth. Surely, people have a right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. There, no one has been convicted. And, and yet, again and again, there's this, there's this slander. How, how is that reasonable? Uh, and then maybe finally, if I have enough time, um, Martin made the point. Uh, I, if I can remember rightly, was that the, the Lama is higher than the deity. Very beautiful. In uh, the Dalai Lama's own explanation of how he came to the conclusion that the was not a was not a reliable protector, he says, the principal sources of this matter have been derived from doble divinations conducted before Lama and the decrees of the Dharma protector, Doji Dragton Netchul, as opposed to what his teacher, Chitam Rinpoche, said. Thank you. So I want to make a few points here. The first, His Holiness Dalai Lama never banned practicing this uh, uh, controversial uh, Dharma protector. He strongly encouraged people not to practice, particularly people who want to come to his teachings. That's what his, his, how he stands. That's his position. Quite often they use ban, ban, ban. That's their want to people believe. Dalai Lama bans. Never. And particularly uh, the Kalsang, he quoted few saying, oh, look at the Dalai Lama's website. Actual quotation makes from Tibetan youth conference, youth organization's statement, not the Dalai Lama's statements. He quoted twice, saying, oh, Dalai Lama's actual quotation, he said, it comes from Tibetan youth. Congress, and that is the fact. Quite often, he is the person, Kalsang, he uh, presents this called ISC News Agent. I'll give you an example, just a small example, how he distorts the facts. In just uh, uh, July, I think that July uh, 14, I think that's the case, uh, sorry, my notes are a little bit distorted. Uh, yeah, July the nineteenth of July, he presented this. I think the uh, ten or fifteen minutes program in that ISC news. What he said. Dalai Lama claims his teacher, Tijang Rinpoche, Do, Tijang Doji Chang, encouraged him to abandon practicing Doji Shukan. That's what he said. Dalai Lama never ever said his, he, you know, uh, uh, Dalai Lama in, you know, encouraged his, his tutor, Tijang Rinpoche, encouraged him to abandon. That's the not case. But in fact, what he is doing, he's, he presents that, but also at the same time he shows as evidence, evidence is this, what His Holiness Dalai Lama's website said. That's what he showed in the screen. His Holiness Dalai Lama renounced practice in 1975 after discovering the profound historical, social, historical, social and religious problems associated with it. He did so with the full knowledge and support of his junior tutor. So what Kelsen did, support, that word, English word support, he twist into saying encourage. 
these two words are totally different meaning. What His Holiness Dalai Lama is saying after his long-term observation on this issue, historically in many different ways, he got he reached the decision. He is not going to uh, worship this spirit anymore. Therefore, he consulted his uh, senior uh, senior tutor as well as his junior tutor, his Tijang uh, Rinpoche. Uh, that moment, Tijang Rinpoche supported, not encouraged. That's a distortion. There are many other that kind of distortions, as one of the other previous uh, speakers said. Oh yes, yes, you know the bandit and show some kind of dramatic picture. They never show those three monks killed in Dharamsala. Must show those two, get a good balance. Facts show the, must show the facts. It's much better than distortion. Then somebody, you talk about international uh, amnesty. International amnesty's position on allegation abuse against worships of Tibetan deity Doji Shukden, June 19, 8, 1998. Now the international amnesty said this. None of the material international amnesty, uh, uh, amnesty international has received contains evidence of abuses which fall within the amnesty international mandate for actions such as grave violations of fundamental human rights. That is amnesty international's reports. June 1998. That's the fact. Now, I want to say just a few words. Somebody said, How, why they didn't quote that, uh, those murderers? Of course, those out of the, the local Indian, government, Indian police, they identified four. Sorry, they all escaped to in, 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 in China, China protecting them. That's how they kind of talk. things to say. Um, the first, I have a question for the NKT people here. The present Karmapa engaged in many prayers for the death of the regent uh, who brought in the other Karmapa recently. He died and, and they had, there was a lot of dispute about what happened when he died because he wanted to have burial in, in Nepal. But the present Karmapa still made all the burial prayers for this, this person who brought in the other Karmapa, right? So my question is, will the NKT also do burial prayers, whatever ritual they use, for His Holiness the Dalai Lama when he dies? Because in the Tibetan tradition, even with your other people, you do it. So that's just a question, okay? My next, you can answer it. <laughs> no, 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 we don't later. want anyone speaking from the... No, but later. Yeah. No, you have another slot. Um, the other is that Kelsen Gets has had to be non-traditional because he was expelled from Sarajay Monastery unanimously in 1996. So he has had to create his own systems because he can't do the orthodox. Um, he doesn't have five fully ordained monks to, to have a traditional ordination. He has to create his own. So the system has developed step by step from there to, to become something quite different. Um, the last thing is, that, um, well, two, two more things very quickly. Um, one is that we've created a Facebook group. Now, Facebook is fascinating because you can get contact with communities that are very different from, from uh, say, in real life. So we're collecting information from Tibetans, from people on the ground in the monasteries. Um, the, the other side have many, many websites already. The websites, the, the group we have on Facebook is called Talk About Shibden, and we're making lots of documents we're having original documents from their website so you can read them. We're having all different information that we're collecting together. So from the Tibetan communities, we will please say, please send in your side of the story as well because that story isn't heard very much by us at all. And we've got people who can translate things. Sometimes it's a bit slow, but we do have translations. So please talk about Shugden on Facebook. The other one is... Um, Oh yes, on that Facebook group, we're answering the videos. 
um, one by one, we're going through the NKT ISC videos and having a conversation about them. So things like what Shitashi was saying now is the continuity of that. Um, the last thing is a bit of fun, really. Um, I started. I was quite astonished when I went outside the NKT and started looking around at protective practices. And something that was really astonish astonishing for me was how different the, the shifting practice in the NKT was from protective practice elsewhere. And there was a lovely quote that, that one, one top um, teacher, a Tibetan teacher, said, oh, no, 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 that Shikton, Dogyo, is it? oh, the, this friend I had who was a practitioner, he used to order Shukton around like a servant. And the idea, instead of being that kind of, it's quite difficult to explain heart deal in, in, in um, the NKT, but you're kind of, you are Shukton, you kind of, Shukdan goes through you and you manifest when you're teaching. But this thing of ordering Shukdan around, I found rather a really kind of exciting idea. Um, <laughs> then the, the oracle practice, that was amazing. It used to exist in the NKT. I saw it myself in 1995 in Brighton because Kelsan Gyatso's uncle was the Shukdan oracle. Um, but it was kind of kept a bit secret, and then when all these difficulties happened, he decided to stay in India with his students. So that separation, that's also created more problems and separation from Kelsang Gyatso because he's had to, to make his own world, if you like. He's had to. Um, and then the last one, in the Nyingma, I was talking to people about how they use protective practice, the Deva, Guru, Guru Deva Dakini. And the Deva is, is very interesting because you, on retreat, you bring up your own negativities so that you can look at them and work with them and transform them. And that's part of your retreat. Now, that's really also really different from how we did <coughs> should in, in NKT. That didn't exist there. And I found that idea absolutely, you know, for a start, the idea of going on retreat, a three-year retreat, because that also has only existed once in the NKT and it doesn't exist anymore. It would be, I, would, I would really rejoice if the NKT created a, a very strong retreat you know, proper retreats and, and liaised and, and connected again with the Tibetan communities. That would be a vision for, for the future. Thank you very much. So, the first question is, do you want to... I, I, yeah, why not? <laughs> I, I, do you want a minute's notice? Or you yeah, please. I think I need to substantiate where I ended, for your benefit, in that sense, that I said at the end uh, of the talk, a lot of Ladakhis were unhappy with what was the time the Shukdin supporters' community activity. Let me be very clear as to what they meant about that. Their view, and this was the general Ladakhi view, was that monasteries, and this is a standard Tibetan view, monasteries are autonomous in their decision-making processes. There is no vow of obedience in Tibetan Buddhism. And in that sense, you're quite correct when you said earlier, sorry, I'll speak to you directly here, um, that the Dalai Lama does not have authority to ban the worship of Shukdun in monasteries. Now, from the Ladakhi perspective, in 1998, they were sitting there going, we're all holding our breath. <gasps> and... What we don't want is for the ban to come here because it's a Tibetan political issue. It's not for Ladakhis. We don't need to make this distinction. What they felt was by 2003 was that the issue had been so internationally polarized into Shugden Paz versus Dalai Lama Paz and everything on those lines that they had to make a call. And because Pa Lama Yoga because the Lama is higher than the gods, because Shukton was, from their perspective, a worldly protector, whereas the Dalai Lama was, their, was a Lama, there was no decision to be made. And actually, most, as uh, you know, you can find this on the web, I've covered it in greater detail, but never mind. They, the, Tibet, the Ladakhi monks themselves went out of their way to, to remove the statues themselves of, of Shukton. It wasn't kind of people coming in from the outside. Actually, they desperately asked people to come in from the outside. They asked Nairi Rinpoche to come along. The Rangdung monks went to Likir and said, please, 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 come to Rangdung so that we can get rid of it. And he actually, they brought a letter to him, and he ripped the letter up and said, you monks, you want to do this? Do it yourself. Which they did. 
So I think that this issue about the autonomy of monasteries is important here. The second point is, I'm going to reiterate Nathan's point, protected deities are political. They have been in Tibetan history forever. They are constitutional entities. Protected deities were regularly and systematically used in warfare. They were used against the British in 1886. Unfortunately, the British had Bren guns. <laughs> Consequently, that was why many of the Tibetans, after being wiped out by the British, decided that Queen Victoria must be a manifestation of the protected deity Paul and Hummel. <laughs> because she's obviously got some serious firepower on her side. <laughs> These things have always been deeply political, and that's a problem. Um, and it's a problem when we say, ooh, we think that religion shouldn't be involved. It is a, that's a cultural clash. Okay, I said I'd say what my opinion was. Um, and, and this, from, so just to finish up, that, this is what I meant when I said that in some crucial sense, from the perspective of those who are supporting Shulton, the internationalization, the very substantial polarization that occurred, that has occurred, that now characterizes the international field of this debate, that radical polarization meant that the Ladakhis got rid of Shulton. Yeah. Now, this is important because, honest to God, this is like watching my parents divorce. <laughs> you know, what starts as one little problem eventually becomes everything. It divides people completely. And it's about what people did in the past and what this history was and that what Lama said about this, that and the other. The question is actually, we have got the situation, next slide please, we got to this situation. We got to the situation where in, 19, in 2008 down in Nottingham, I remember a woman walking past the, 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 the short-term practitioners who were doing it and she went, hmm. Religious. They're packing nutters, doesn't mean it didn't matter whether they're Buddhist or Muslim or whatever, they're all nutters. We've got to a situation where the Central Tibetan Administration is putting this kind of list up. This is rubbish, all of it. The, and I'm going to, let me be precise here, the manner in which this dispute has been carried out by both sides. I'm going to have to ask. Yeah, no, I, I'm going to finish the sentence on this one. <laughs> the manner in which this dispute has been carried out on both sides has been counterproductive to the goals of both. Mm -hmm. We need to think better than this. I don't have much more to say. There was been said already. Um, I think um, Martin has put it all to the point. Um, again, we hear about bands, but I've not read a band. I've not seen it. We hear about excessive reactions. Nobody doubts there have been excessive reactions. And Martin gave some example. Uh, but what I'm missing a little bit is the, the essence of it. Uh, as Martin showed in the case of the, the uh, Ladakhi uh, Monastery, um, and this is not only in the Ladakhi Monastery, it was generally in the, in the region which were uh, Gelugpas. It is true, it is true, uh, Shukden worship had become a very normal, usual thing. Nobody reflected much about it. Well, some people, most people did. But it still is a fact that at the beginning, the whole point of the introduction of the Shukden worship, the whole dispute between people who were uh, uh, in favor of the policy of the Fifth Dalai Lama and people who were against, this was about divisiveness, I'm sorry. This was about to make a difference between the pure 
teachings and those which were perverted by other schools. So, if we say that the Buddhist world is being divided, well, first it's not the Buddhist world who, who say that, I think it was Nathan who said, well, it's not the Buddhist world, it's the small Gelugpa world, let's, let's be correct about that. And it's been that yes, of course, where well, there is a dispute, people are divided, and that's normal. That's what happens in every society, and it happens in the field of religion, as we know. Uh, the religion is not only, religion is not only exception, so it's rather rule an exception that happens in the religious uh, world, in religious things. But the point of dispute is about the question whether there is a school or tendency or lineage even within Tibetan Buddhism which is superior, not superior, sorry, more pure than others. It is not for me to decide whether it is so or not. I have to study that from outside, right? But at the moment when you take this discourse, we are representing the right of course, it's more the rule than the exception, again, in the, in the world of religions. But that's always a problem everywhere. So we have to see that the whole Chukden issue from the basis, from the very first day, is all about that. Who belongs to us is on the side of the pures, and who doesn't is not. And this is a divisive discourse, I'm very sorry. And if you have a divisive discourse, if you have divisive practice, and it goes into politics, and into, into you know, how the government is run, and who in the time of the exile, who's been sent to Switzerland from Dharamsala? The old people were from the relative <coughs> to the uh, 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 circles. Why? Because those who were taking the decision were all belonging to the group. So you see, these things, this, which has nothing to do with religion anymore, of course. This is a purely political, sociological issue. But this is linked from the start. And of course, when... Uh, Religious authority like the Dalai Lama, now you may, you may think he's right, you may think he's wrong, but he's an authority. And if he say, I don't agree with that, then every Tibetan, every at least among the Gulupas who are concerned directly, will have to take a position, well, I agree with the Dalai Lama or I don't. And if they don't, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's all right. And of course, there should not be a, a, a came to be damaged because of that, but Again, we hear about people being killed, we hear about terrible things happening. We hear about that, but I haven't seen much evidence of it. I've heard and I've seen things which I think were not very nice. Martin was speaking about the list which was published on CTS website. Uh, we've seen some not very nice words being written at, what was that, a shop or something like this? Uh, people this is not nice. And this is certainly not in the sense of, uh, of Tibetan Buddhism, of the essence of Tibetan Buddhism. But this is not Tibetan Buddhism, this is people. And um, who sits in the glass house should not throw a stone, isn't it? They say. Okay, there will be more to say, but she doesn't allow me. <laughs> Okay, sorry you couldn't see the rest of the film, um, maybe another time. The Dalai Lama's ban is a denial of religious freedom. And it's a denial of human rights. It's causing immense human suffering and it's not necessary. It has no beneficial result. It is destroying Buddhism. The Dalai Lama often says there is no ban. But this is not true. There is a ban and he has caused it through his power and influence. He sometimes says that no one's being harmed by the ban, that it is just rumour. But this is not true. There is segregation, apartheid, and very widespread suffering. Because of his reputation, people everywhere <coughs> believe whatever the Dalai Lama says. 
when the international Shubdan community organized demonstrations against the Dalai Lama in Europe this year, during his visit to Italy, for instance, the Italian police forces were on high alert. Why? Because the Dalai Lama's office had told the mayor of the Italian city that we were dangerous criminals and terrorists. During the demonstrations, the police realized that we were not at all dangerous. Far from it. They clearly understood that although our protests were very loud and sustained, we were very, in fact, very peaceful, disciplined and good-natured. During his US and European tours this year, the Dalai Lama's security photographed Tibetan Shugden demonstrators and posted the names and photographs of 34 of them on the CTA website, stating, and this was just yesterday, that they have a history of violence, including murder, physical assault and arson. Because of many false accusations against Shugden protesters by the Dalai Lama and the CTA, we are regarded as criminals, and people are afraid of us. But we're not bad people. We're not evil. We're not extreme. We criticize the Dalai Lama only because we have no choice. We have no other way to stop the persecution and suffering that he has caused. The source of all this persecution, discrimination and suffering within the Tibetan exile communities and beyond from 1996 <coughs> up to the present day is the Dalai Lama. If you, <coughs> if you really want to help him, you should ask the Dalai Lama to change himself. If you really want... Please not to make audible, you know, comment, well, even if it's a, a laugh or something, it's quite disrespectful. Are we stopping the clock for this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it'll probably, it'll probably be done fairly soon anyway. Uh, yeah. We criticize the Dalai Lama only because we have no choice, as I say. We have no other way to stop the persecution and suffering that he's caused. The source of all this persecution and suffering... So what was I saying? If you really want to help him, if you really want to save and protect the Dalai Lama's reputation, you should ask the Dalai Lama to change himself. Because the source of this problem is himself. Please, if we want to solve this problem, please use your influence to ask the Dalai Lama to do these four things to solve the problem. One, allow anyone who wishes to practice Dorje Shugden the freedom to do so. Two, Stop completely the discrimination against Shugden practitioners. Three, allow all Shugden monks and nuns who have been expelled to return to their monasteries and nunneries and to receive the same material and spiritual rights as non-Shugden practitioners. And four, write Dalai Lama should write to the Tibetan communities throughout the world that they should apply practically these three points. These four points are in this leaflet. If the Dalai Lama does these four things, the problem will be quickly solved. The Tibetan people will be reunited. Harmony between Buddhist traditions will be restored and his own reputation will be saved. The only way to solve this problem, the only way to solve this problem is for the Dalai Lama to change himself. Please use your beneficial influence to help the Dalai Lama to change himself by accepting the four points in this leaflet. Okay, so uh, now I'll just make a few points and then uh, we'll close. So I have five points I'd like to make. The first one is that um, I'm a little surprised that either the international shooting community 
or uh, kind of Carol vis-a-vis the NKT expects freedom from a religion. Religion is all about authority and discipline and, you know, doing what you're told. So uh, I think that's the, the, the whole, how can I say, practice of religion is about changing who you are, which you can't do by yourself. You need a context of discipline to do that. So, so I see, to some extent, this uh, clash of cultures between the Western ethos of, kind of liberality and freedom as just in conflict with traditional religion. Uh, the second point I w- want to make is this on this question of authority, which is the Gandhian Tripa is the head of the Gaelic school. The Dalai Lama appoints the Gandhian Tripa. So it seems like from a sort of legalistic perspective, if you want to look for uh, authorities on orthodoxy uh, in the Gaelic school, if these two parties agree about something, that's a pretty good starting point. But, as Martin said, uh, there isn't a vow of uh, obedience in, in Tibetan Buddhism, and a person's relationship to their own tantra commitments, their own guru, their own deities, is, is uh, let's say, at least as important and often more important than institutional commitments. Uh, so, you know, the question of uh, authority we are seeing falls out along those lines. The third point I just want to make is about Pabonka Rinpoche. Uh, I had occasion recently in circumstances totally unrelated to any of this to read some of uh, Pabonka's letters in Tibetan and uh, he says very clearly that only Gelugs uh, will achieve enlightenment, that all other practitioners of all other schools of Buddhism or any other religion will go straight to hell. Um, and uh, in those letters, he did not uh, promote uh, the violent conversion of uh, monasteries, but uh, it's, I th- it's relatively uncontroversial in Tibetan studies that, that he did that. And in any case, whether or not he personally did, the Gaelic school uh, you know, is no, uh, no stranger to violence in the name of religion. And I think that's just an important thing to you know, get on the record. And um, the fourth point is that the suffering that some uh, propitiants of Dorje Shudan have, have, have experienced is, is you know, self-evident. Uh, kind of what, how to quantify that or how to characterize it uh, may be controversial, but it's clear that some people are upset, yeah? And I think um, that, let's say, the other side, those who uh, who, who think that the propitiation of Dorje is problematic should be more cognizant uh, of that upsetness and to uh, recognize it as, you know, as legitimate, at least for those who experience it. And then five, I would really like to uh, agree uh, with Martin about the tone in which this controversy is conducted. I felt like tonight went kind of pretty good until we got to the five minute uh, pieces. Uh, But I can say from my own personal experience, I've organized uh, many, many of these uh, events here at SOAS and I've taught Tibetan for a long time. Uh, This is the best attended uh, thing we've had. Uh, But also in the run up to this uh, event, I've received a lot of correspondence and I think uh, it included the the most uh, uh, rude and malicious uh, things I have ever received from anyone, uh, and you know that's. Can you say one name? I haven't write a single write single name for you. Oh no no no! I, I no one no no one no one on this panel. Everyone on this panel has been a perfect gentleman or gentlewoman. Uh, I've gotten message. I've gotten things mailed to me from California and emails from Germany. I've had people. Uh, uh, take responses of mine that were that were intended privately and post them on the internet, uh, and this kind of behavior is just extremely appalling, and uh, and that for this debate to make any progress, it's necessary that people conduct themselves like adults. Yeah. <laughs> So then, 